And I want you to take your Bible tonight, if you will, please, and turn to John chapter 17. For a few weeks now, we've been looking at uh, what is called uh, the upper room discourse, and that is the words of the Lord Jesus prior to his death on that cross. And these were special times and, and special words that he shared with his disciples. Uh, most of it up in the upper room. Uh, they left the upper room uh, in, at, at the end of chapter 14. Chapter 17 is where we are tonight. And I want to say this, that John 17 is the true Lord's Prayer. Not the Lord's Prayer that you learned, perhaps, in Sunday school. You know what? When I was uh, a child, if I remember correctly, we learned the Lord's Prayer in school, in public school. Uh, we learned the Lord's Prayer, and we said it every morning. Uh, no more, of course. But uh, this is the true Lord's Prayer, John chapter 17. And by the way, it is the longest prayer in the New Testament as well. And I think it's wonderful that God the Holy Spirit saw fit to let us get a glimpse of and listen in on the prayer of Jesus himself when he as a man walked this earth. And what he prays for, look quickly, the first five verses he prays for himself. The rest of that uh, prayer is for his followers. He prays for his disciples specifically in verses 6 through 19. And guess what he does in verse 20? Look at verse 20. He says in verse 20, Neither pray I for these alone, that is for the twelve disciples, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. In other words, that's me and that's you. That's all believers that would uh, come to receive Jesus as their personal Savior. So first, a prayer for self, and then a prayer for his followers. That's how we want to approach it tonight. That's how we want to look at it. Let's take a moment, and let's just pause and let everyone get settled and uh, have a, a word of prayer asking the Lord to really direct our, our thinking and uh, our time of meditation today. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for the privilege that we have of coming together in your name. I thank you, Lord, that uh, you saw fit to allow us to listen in to your prayer. This is holy ground. And it's not just that we look at your prayer tonight, but your prayer that you poured out just before you were offering up yourself as the sacrifice for our sin, as you would hang as our substitute. Lord, what a privilege it is. And I pray that, dear Holy Spirit of God, you would take the words that we look at tonight and drive them deep into our soul. And would you use it to have a, a real life-changing effect Holy Spirit, I thank you that you undertake for me. I depend upon you. And give the glory to Jesus, the one whose prayer we look at tonight. And thank him. Amen. So let's look quickly at the first five verses, and I'm not going to look in detail, but in the first five verses of John chapter 17, the true Lord's Prayer, he begins by praying for himself. And what he prays basically for himself is that he would be glorified. And he makes uh, specifically six requests in these first five verses, and I want you to note them with me real quickly. In verse 1, he prays that at this very time, his Father would glorify him. See what he says there? Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son may also 
glorify thee. So he, he's praying, Father, now's the time for the Messiah, Jesus, to be glorified. And you know what that glorifying includes? How is he going to be glorified? It includes his suffering. It includes his crucifixion. It includes his death as well, of course, of his resurrection. But this is the purpose for which he came. When he says the time is now, it means this is the very purpose for which I've come to this earth. And so, first of all, his request and his prayer for himself is that now is the time for Jesus to be glorified. Let's look at another request he makes, verse 2. Uh, he, he prays here, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, meaning the Son himself, Jesus, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. His second request has to do with the fact that Jesus is authorized to give eternal life to his people. He is the source of our salvation. And he is the source of all salvation's provision. He's authorized by the Father. Look at his third uh, request in verse 3. This is very interesting, I think. And this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Third part of his uh, praying here and his request is pertaining to eternal life. And look at how he defines eternal life. This is usually not the way we define eternal life. We define eternal life usually as going to heaven, right? Mm -hmm. Not how he defines it. Eternal life here is defined as knowing God. Not knowing about God, but knowing God personally. Knowing God, and as a result of that, obtaining, receiving God's life from himself. Here's what eternal life is. Eternal life is more a quality than a quantity. What I mean by that is... It's more about a personal relationship with the Lord than it is going to heaven. Now, eternal life includes going to heaven, but if you think eternal life only begins when you get to heaven, you don't understand what eternal life is. Eternal life is knowing God. Eternal life is having a personal relationship with Him. Because guess what? He is eternal life. In 1 John chapter 1, Jesus is referred to by that title. He is the eternal life. Look at his next request. Uh, go back for a moment in verse 2, because in, in that uh, second verse, he gives us some interesting information. Not only is he authorized uh, to give eternal life, but we also note in verse 2, and it's repeated again in verse 6, and, and again in, in uh, I think, uh, uh, 8 and 9, this fact that believers are the Father's gift to Jesus. See that? Go back to verse 2 and, and note it. Here's what he says. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. See that? Down in verse uh, 6, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Verse 8, For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and I have and have known surely that I came from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. Verse 9, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me. Believers are the Father's gift to the Son. You go back to John chapter 6. Don't turn there, but just listen. The Bible says 
that it is the Father that draws people to believe upon the Son. But listen to me very carefully. Listen to me very carefully because this is an important point. And that is, but no one, though drawn by the Father, comes to Jesus except by personal choice. You are never arbitrarily drawn to the Lord without any choice on your part. And not everyone that is drawn to the Lord comes to him. Because he said, and I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself, right? So the Father draws people to the Lord, and the people that by personal choice believe upon the Lord are the Father's gift to the Son. That's how he prays here. Here's a fifth part of his prayer. Look at verse 4 with me. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Wait a minute. He hasn't suffered and died on the cross yet. If you look at the word finish, it is past tense. I have finished the work. As he prays, it's as if he's already completed it. In other words, his prayer is so certain. It is such confidence. That's the kind of prayer he wants us to have because it's based on the very word and power of God. And then one final thing I wanted to mention. Look at verse 5. And now, O Father, glorify thou with me with thine own self, with the glory, notice this, which I had with thee before the world was. In his prayer here, he's asking the Father to restore the glory that he had before he ever was incarnate, before he ever came as a babe. In other words, here is the truth that the one that is in a human body and it is and is praying and is soon going to suffer a an excruciating death on that cross he's the eternal god restore to me the glory that i enjoyed before i took on this task to come to this earth that's his prayer for himself Beginning in verse 6 and, and really through the rest of the prayer, the rest of this 17th chapter, he's praying for his followers. You know, think about this. The Bible says, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, has risen again, and is seated on the right hand, making intercession for us. You ever wonder what he prays for us? What kind of intercession would he make for us? Well, maybe we can get an idea by looking at the intercession that he makes for us in these verses as we listen in to his prayer just prior to his crucifixion. It's an example of Jesus' intercession for us. And Hebrews says he ever lives to make intercession for us. It's a continual ministry that he has for us. I remember hearing someone say, if I could hear Jesus praying for me in the next room, I wouldn't fear anything. Think what strength that would give you in temptation. What's your greatest temptation to sin? Think what strength, what victory that would give. If you could hear Jesus, he is. He's praying for you. He intercedes for you, for me, if you're a believer. And he intercedes for us in a specific way. I want you to uh, jump down with me, if you would, to verse 11. Here's what he says. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father. Here's the word. Keep, keep through thine own name, those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. 
That word keep is the word that I emphasized because it means guard or it means to protect. And it is the same word that is used in the little letter of Jude, the first verse. We are kept. We, he, we are kept by God. And it's talking in Jude 1, it's talking about that we are guarded, that we are, uh, our salvation is secure eternally. But that's not what, how the word's used here. In this particular passage, when he prays, Father, keep them, guard them, protect them, he's not talking about making their salvation secure, but rather he's talking about protecting their Christian experience. It's another way of saying, Lord, sanctify them. Mm -hmm. Lord, put a, a, a wall around them and guard them and keep, keep their Christian experience pure. Guard it. You all probably heard the horrible news about that uh, Indonesian crew of submariners that uh, were lost at sea last week. They found uh, recently the submarine broken up in three parts, very deep. You know, a submarine is, is an amazing uh, piece of engineering. You can get into a submarine, of course, and you are enabled to exist in a realm that otherwise would be impossible for you to exist in. That is when they function properly. What's he praying here? When he says keep, he's saying, Lord, in this evil world, keep these people. Keep their Christian experience pure. Keep it secure. And there are two ways in which he does that. The two ways in which Jesus prays that the Father would keep our Christian lives guarded and protected. Look at the first one in verse 11. Keep, notice this, through thy name. See that? Keep through thy name. Now, God, his name, keep through thy name. He's the living word. He's the living word of God. So how are we kept? How are we guarded in our Christian experience? First of all, as he prays, we are kept by the living word of God. We're kept by his name, by God himself. What is his name? You remember when Moses asked that question? Who shall I say sent me? And God's answer was? I am. Yehovah, right? I am. Tell them I am sent me. It's, that name is like an unfinished sentence. You finish it. I am whatever you need. I am your purity. I am your peace. I am your power. You finish that unfinished sentence that his name implies. Keep through thy name is what he's saying here. In John chapter 8 and verse 58, he's dealing with the Jewish leaders and he, he says to them, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And they said, what? <laughs> You're not 50 years old. What do you mean, Abraham? Abraham was dead and buried thousands of years ago. Yeah? And then he says this, before Abraham was, I am. I am. I am. Keep through thy name the living word of God. In other words, Jesus does not just supply the needs. He not only gives us the provision that we need to live a holy, victorious Christian life, he is that provision himself. The I am. That's why we sang tonight, he is all I need. He doesn't just supply all I need. He is all I need. Wisdom, righteousness, and power. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30. Basis for that. He's all that. And in that 30th verse, he is my sanctification. He is the, the, the keep. <laughs> He's the keep. 
as well as the keeper. Okay. Second way in which in this prayer, he prays that God would, sanct would sanctify or keep his people. And uh, for this, look down with me at verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Okay? Two ways, two ways in which God keeps us in this evil world intact, pure, sanctified. How does he do it? He does it, first of all, through the living word of God, his name. He does it, secondly, through the written word of God, his truth. Thy word, he says, is truth. And the Bible is vital to all spiritual life. You neglect the book, you will not live a Christian life. You may live something that looks like a Christian life, but it's not genuine, it's not real. You neglect the Bible, you will never live a genuine Christian life. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And uh, it's very interesting as well to note in verse 8, he says, For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest unto me. Notice in verse 17, it's W-O-R-D, singular. In verse 8, it's W-O-R-D-S, plural. Two different words for word. And specific meanings. Here's, here's the difference. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Is speaking to all of the speaking about all of the Bible. But words keep the. I've given them thy words. Verse eight is a specific word that literally means specific sayings. You know, you can't live the Christian life genuinely without the Bible. But you know what the Lord does? When you get into the Bible, he'll give you a special, specific word from the Bible for you as an individual. It's the difference between the word logos, the whole Bible, and the word rima, specific sayings from the Bible. Like the verse that, we, we, that was put to music and we've sung, Isaiah 40, 31. That is a rhema in so many people's lives. It's not, just a, uh, uh, it's not just a Bible verse. It's something that has been translated into their soul and has given them strength, right? Because they've understood it and claimed it. That's how he keeps us. He prays that we, will, that, that we will know what it is to be sanctified. And here's a, another prayer that he makes for his followers, verse 18. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. Not only does he pray his father that we would find ourselves to be the objects which he will sanctify, but that we would be a people that uh, through him we would occupy. As my Father has sent me, he says, as uh, you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. You know, the reason that believers are in this hostile world, this evil world, is not because we've been left here. Not at all. We've been sent here. We've been sent by Jesus himself. He says that. Why was Jesus sent? He says, as I was sent, Father, by you, so I'm sending them, like you sent me. Well, he was sent here on a rescue mission, right? That's what you're here for. You're here on a rescue mission. You're not here to whatever your goal is in life. Build a career, make a lot of money, have a beautiful home. Is any of that wrong? No, not necessarily. But that's not really what you're here for. 
You're here like Jesus on a rescue mission. That's what everything else is supposed to uh, lead to. And he says it again. When he rises from the dead and he appears in an upper room, those disciples are there, and he breathes upon them and says, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. And he says, If the Father has sent me, so send I you. What he prayed to the Father, he says to them. In John chapter 20, verse 21. So we need to be certain that we're living for the right reason that we're here for. Is there someone that God has been calling you or leading you to tell about Jesus? Some particular individual that he's put on? Go ye into all the world. Teach all nations. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Literally, as you go, wherever you're going, whatever you're doing, realize that that's not really why you're going. Your goal in going is that on your way, you're telling people about Jesus wherever you are, whatever you're doing. Third prayer request for his followers, sanctify, occupy, and the third one, look at verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them which also shall believe on me through their word, verse 21, that they may all be one, as thou, Father, art in me and I in them, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Third request, sanctify, occupy, unify. See that? The culmination, really, of the Lord's prayer here is for us to unify. And that is a spiritual, invisible unity. It's what we have as one in the Lord. It's a unity with others that is based on our unity with the Lord. Look at verse 23. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved me as thou hast loved me. You see how important this unified prayer request is? that the world may know. That's the specific purpose here. And uh, it's a kind of unity that Jesus prays for us that is very specific. It's, it's that we would personally possess and share Jesus' life. And if we do that, the Holy Spirit will create a unity of purpose. We'll all share the same purpose if we have the life of the Spirit in us. And then we will personally possess and share Jesus' love as well as his life. The Holy Spirit will create in us a, a similar heart. You can see that in the scripture. You can see that, for example, in the book of Acts, in verse 14. This is the uh, disciples, and they're praying after Jesus has uh, ascended. They all continue in one accord in prayer. That is a unity. That's a unity of purpose. They're all praying for the same thing. They're praying for the, the, the coming of the Spirit. And then in verse 1 of chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost has fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. There is a unity of purpose and a unity of heart. And the Spirit comes. God's prayer reveals some things in our lives that are important to Jesus. First of all, he cares about you. He cares about you and he wants you to be sanctified, he wants you to be occupied, and he wants you to be unified if you're a believer. We unify only as we cooperate with the, with the Spirit's work to sanctify. And as we do, then we will be effective as we occupy till he comes. See how Jesus' prayer request for us is all linked? But it all hinges on your personal choices, on your personal willingness to cooperate with the Spirit to sanctify you, to work in your life. Are you resisting the Spirit's sanctifying work in your life? 
or are you working alongside of the sanctifying ministry of the Spirit of God? It's interesting to me that in a way you have the opportunity to answer the prayer of Jesus by allowing the Holy Spirit to sanctify your life. And he will then enable you to be occupied for him. And you'll be unified in purpose with your brothers and sisters as well. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that you would use this prayer to just teach our hearts and uh, give us desires to live to live up to the prayer that you prayed in this 17th chapter. Lord, that we would participate with you and cooperate with you to see your prayer answered. We thank you, Holy Spirit of God. You are the sanctifier. And you enable us to occupy. And you're the one that unifies. We're praising you for that. We're asking now that you might continue to remind us of these things. And even that we would go back into this chapter and perhaps reread it and be reminded and and uh, just uh, reinvigorated regarding this truth in Jesus' name.